Tonight's seminar is part of a Thinker in Residence program where I invite leading researchers and practitioners to Perth to learn more about and raise awareness of issues that impact our children and young people. I'm pleased to welcome the 2016 thinker, Professor Jane Burns, here this evening. Professor J Burns is a Professor of Innovation and Industry at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of Health Services. Pro Professor Burns is um, a strong advocate promoting the importance of wellbeing and the mental health of children and young people, a very important element, as, as I've said before. The theme of this year's Think Here in Residence program is strengthening children and young people's mental health and wellbeing through technology and social media. I think we'd all agree that the online environment is a space where all of our children and young people generally enjoy spending their time. And to many of us, it's a bit of a mystery, and it need not be. As parents and caregivers, and myself as a grandparent, I, we all want to make sure that children and young people have the resilience they need to stay safe when they're in the online world. I hope that this evening can take uh, away strategies, so, sorry, I hope that this evening you can take away strategies to help you support your child or your grandchild into the future. Our speakers are going to have uh, a period of time where they will address you on a range of issues, including PowerPoint. Uh, we've in deliberately included two young people, as I've said, Jeremy and Giselle, to give you their sense of, of why uh, or how they perceive their world. And at the end, we're hoping that we'll have enough time for uh, 10 to 15 minutes of just general questions from the floor. So if you have some questions, if you can leave them to last, that would be great. Before we start with Professor Burns, I would like to acknowledge uh, all of our sponsors, and you can see on the uh, pin-ups or the pull-ups that are on the stage, these events um, are not only expensive to hold, but um, they're, they're really important to have, and we are supported very strongly by a range of organisations. So I would like to acknowledge Rio Tinto, Edith Cowan University, the Department of Education, the Department of Child Protection and Family Support, Child and Adolescent Health Service, the Mental Health Commission, Disability Service Commission, Telethon Kids Institute, Miralinga, and Yakwa. You can see such a diverse group of community industry leaders have decided that this is such an important event that they need to sponsor it, and we certainly welcome and thank them for that sponsorship. So let's get straight into it, and uh, I would love to uh, now introduce Professor Jane Burns. Uh, to do her presentation to you. Please welcome Professor Jane Burns. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, elders past, present and future. Um, it is an absolute delight to be here, not only because I'm on a panel with someone of the highest esteem, uh, Professor Donna Cross, but also because we're hearing from two wonderful young people, Giselle and Jeremy. And as you'll hear me talk, um, the importance of giving young people voice and putting young people in control of what is happening for them is incredibly important for building mental health and well-being. So I feel privileged to be here. It is the third time that I've been to Perth in four weeks. There is something special about Perth. I think it's the sunshine. It's just quite astonishing. Um, so I'm here for the week and it's an absolute delight. So, a little bit about me to start with. I am mum to what I think uh, are three absolutely beautiful children. I think anyone who is mum, dad, parent, caregiver loves their children. Um, but it's interesting, with Harry, he's my beautiful little boy. He's very sensitive. And I say to him, well, I used to say to him when he was this little, he's now six, Harry, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he'd say, mummy, I want to be a clown. And I'd say, a doctor clown? No, mummy, just a clown. A lawyer clown? No, mummy, just a clown. And Holly, who's now seven, she's robust. She's one of those children who is always going to be able to pick herself up. And if you've got a girl who's like that, they're quite astonishing. Anyway, I'd say to her, Holly, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a fairy. OK, a doctor fairy? <laughs> no, mummy, just a fairy. A lawyer fairy? No, mummy, just a fairy. I just think to myself, they clearly take after their father. <laughs> they have not got my genes whatsoever. 
But it's important to note, I mean, my husband, like the sunshine here, is sunshiny. He has a personality that is sunshine. And I think what people often fail to understand is that mental health or mental wealth or the way in which we're made up is a complex mix of the way in which your genes come together with your personality, with the environment in which you spend your time, with the stresses that you might experience. And so for my eldest, Angus, Angus is a gorgeous little boy who was born with Down syndrome. At about the age of two, he was diagnosed, or three, he was diagnosed with autism. So Angus is non-verbal. And I think for me, having worked in the area of youth mental health and suicide prevention for many, many years, and having worked in technology for the last probably 15, with Angus, what became very, very evident and clear to me was that for the first time in history, technology has the capacity to actually provide our children and our young people with an opportunity to connect in amazing and meaningful ways, ways in which we had never imagined. Now, I'm not going to talk about cyber safety tonight because I'll leave that to Donna and uh, to our two wonderful young people. Um, but what I am really interested in, and as a parent, I think every parent would put their hand up and say, I am terrified about what my young person or my child is doing online. What I want to talk about a little bit tonight is how we can use these technologies to actually facilitate engagement, to create opportunities to support young people, to look after their own mental health and wellbeing with the support of their families, their schools, their universities when they make it to university and their community. So that's a little bit about me. About a year ago, I was asked to go out and speak to the leadership at Monash University. And again, I was saying to Colin today, I'm always astounded by the amazing leadership shown by young people. Certainly when I was growing up, I would never have imagined in a million years getting up on a stage or being involved in the creation of a service that would be of benefit to young people. And they said to me, and they said it through five questions, and I'm going to talk to you about two of them, but she sa they said, you know, what would you tell yourself now? Or what, what, what would you, your, your advice be? And I said, well... How did you get to where you are? That's what they said to me. And I said, well, this is the advice that I would give, which is a, a lunar cartoon, which is life is complex, it's messy, it's challenging, um, it's not always smooth sailing, and it's not always happy clappy. And in many ways, we set ourselves up as adults, but also as young people and as children, to believe that it is always going to be simple and easy. And so one of the challenges, and also the opportunities, is helping people, both young and older, to navigate life when it's messy. And I think these pathways are the multiple ways to get to a certain end point. And I think one of our young people today put it perfectly. Her mental illness doesn't define her. It is a part of her journey of life. But I think the Lunig cartoon captures it perfectly. The other thing this group of amazing leadership from Monash said to me is, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? And for anyone on social media, that's the one that goes around quite a bit, about what would you tell yourself? Well, this is what I'd tell myself. Do not get a perm. <laughs> but anyone who grew up in the 80s, it is a really bad look. And I said to Giselle tonight, don't be nervous. I'm about to show a photo of myself as an 18-year-old as a perm. Uh, with a perm. With a perm, not as a perm. But the other thing you tend to forget as you get a bit older is that adolescence and the teenage years are about feeling awkward and they're about trying to fit in and they're about all the things that change from when you're as a little person child, which relies on mum and dad and carers and grandmothers and grandfathers, but as you start to evolve into your teenage years, there's a disconnect from mum and dad. There's a search for a sense of autonomy. There's wanting to belong and trying to fit in, but at the same time, you want to be a bit different. So I think that's the thing that we constantly should remind ourselves, that our children are all different, and their journey will be different to ours but that it's not always neat sailing, and as my perm would attest, um, you're not always feeling as confident as you would like to in your own skin. So, about 20 plus years ago, I started working in suicide prevention. It was during a time when uh, Australia's suicide rates were at their highest, and I was employed to conduct an evidence-based literature review looking at uh, suicide and what we could do to prevent it. And there are a few things that were challenging with this particular story. First, I was an incredibly young person myself. I actually had no idea about what it meant to do an economic evaluation. The other thing was it's impossible to put a dollar value on the, on the cost of a life lost. 
And I think it's fair to say 20 years on, while we had the evidence back then about what works in suicide prevention, people feeling connected, people feeling valued, people feeling a part of their communities, people feeling safe and supported, we still have not been able to address the issue of youth mental health. And so 20 plus years on, the current situation, suicide still is the leading cause of death in our young people. In an average year 12 classroom, one young person will have attempted suicide. And the stats are sobering. One in four young people experience a mental health disorder, and 75% of young people aged 16 to 24 still do not seek help. Now the challenge of this is despite all of the fabulous work that all of the amazing organisations have done across the youth mental health sector, reachout.com, which was started back in 1997 to reach out to young people in rural, regional, remote communities, Beyond Blue started in 2000, Kids Helpline, Lifeline, Headspace, there's a whole host of resources out there. But when you speak to young people and when you speak to parents, they'll often say, we don't know what these resources are, and we don't know how to access them, and sometimes when we do, they don't quite ne meet our needs. So back in 2010, I was tasked by the Inspire Foundation, the founders of reachout.com, to bring together universities, along with industry, along with the not-for-profit sector, to really think about how we could create a game-changer in youth mental health. And one of the things we said right from the outset, so this is back in 2010, was our young people have to be at the centre of the decision making. They have to be as important as all of the wonderful professors who made up that advisory group. They are as important as the CEOs who drive those organisations. And the reason they are is because they are partners in the research and in the creation of the products. Because only if you create products for young people, with, product, uh, with young people, will they start to use them and will they start to share them with their friends. And if you start to think about young people as partners, in research, in practice and policy, it starts to change the way you think about providing support, care and nurturing um, the strengths of young people. So we came at it from very much a strengths-based approach. Every young person that we work with has the capacity to give something amazing back to their society. Over the course of the five years, 80 young people, diversity of life experiences, uh, age range from 12 through to 25, um, from all over the country, and they did. They drove the research agenda of the Young and Well CRC. 39 major projects, of which I'm going to talk to you about a few of them. But the important thing they said to us was, technologies are part and parcel of who we are and our lives. It doesn't define us, it's part of how we interact, it's part of how we communicate. We are interested in these technologies because they allow us to connect in ways we haven't imagined. They give us a potential to access support and care 24-7 in a way that is confidential, in a way that is non-stigmatising. And I think listening to those words back then, what was really important was how do you actually bring together all these disparate pieces? Now in the world of Web 4.0, we were talking about it earlier, the idea of digital content, the idea of websites, campaigns, apps, biometrics, small and big data, assistive technology, all of the things that could potentially improve society and add value to society and enhance the inclusion of people. But what does it actually look like to bring it together? So this is the current state. And I've talked about some of the organisations. Reach Out, Beyond Blue, Lifeline, Kids Helpline, Butterfly Foundation in Eating Disorders. There are literally hundreds of organisations, both at a national level and at a state-based level. And what young people are saying to us is, we don't know how to navigate this system and it's hard for us to understand what resources are available for us, when we need them, and how we should use them. Parents similarly are saying, we don't understand how to use these resources, we don't understand when to reach out for support and care, or when we should be concerned about uh, young people and what's going on for them. So what we said is, what would it look like to bring all of these resources together in a way that was meaningful for young people and for their families? Within their schools, within their universities, and within their workplaces, so that these services didn't sit as online resources that people might accidentally fall over, that they were actually embedded within the school, within the university, within the workplace, so that people felt that they could use them. And rather than looking at a focus on wait until you become unwell, we said, how do we actually bring these into a format that makes sense for people to stay well, to look after their mental health, to focus on their mental fitness, 
to think about how they can build their capacity to deal with adversity. And what might be right for me may not be right for Colin or may not be right for Donna. And so what does it mean to actually create customised processes around giving people the right care at the right time, the right support at the right time, depending on their needs? And so Synergy was designed, and it was designed with the concept that there is no wrong door. You shouldn't have to wait until you are unwell to get support and care. It should be about how do you manage your own self-care, your own self-support, use your own data, which a lot of people are doing through their own apps and through their biometric devices. Who uses a biometric device? Jawbone or Up? Yes, a few people. Who uses apps? Most people. <laughs> how do you actually use them in a way that allows you to understand the use of this app is improving my well-being? or the use of this app is helping me manage my stress. And so the idea being, there is no wrong door. It doesn't matter if you find it online, it doesn't matter if you access it through your school, or through your workplace, or through your university, or indeed through your community. What matters is that you actually find your way into this support network. So through the idea of no wrong door, and the idea that there is no wrong door, and that people's data is their own data, we created the idea of a wellbeing plan. What does it actually mean to build capacity around the things that people want to focus on? The idea of Happiness Central is that you focus on doing a quick survey. Young people designed it, young people came up with the concept. It's easy, simple, easy to fill in. iPad, iPhone um, technology. And it focuses on the strengths of a person and their capacity to engage. It then takes those survey results gives you a well-being plan which says this is how you can manage, this is how you can support yourself, this is how you can get through difficult times. Whether it's exam stress, i.e. like you guys are about to experience uh, with year 11, or whether it's actually managing anxiety, whether it's something like a stressful life event, whether it's something that's causing you great concern like bullying or victimisation, which I think Donna will talk about. But the idea being it's your customised plan and you choose and make that choice based on what's right for you. The apps then connect. So you can see, if I'm focusing on getting enough sleep, which I'll talk about in a minute, it should increase your capacity to concentrate, it should increase your capacity to be engaged at school. You should start to feel that your mood improves. So the idea is that the data connects so that you can see in real time how the different resources and apps are impacting on you. And you can do that with the support of your mum, your dad, your parents, your professional that you might be working with, but the idea is that you are actually in control. And when you talk to young people and you talk about empowering young people, which we did today with a beautiful young woman, she said, it's actually really important for me that I know that I have control over this, but that I've got the support of the people who care for me, and that my data is my data and I can choose how I share it and how I use it. So that's the idea of Happiness Central and the idea of linking the system. What does it actually mean for you parents tonight sitting here in terms of the resources that you might use? And the reality is, and I think increasingly we forget this, children and young people are curious. They are interested in, we're pushing this whole agenda around STEM, they're interested in science, they're interested in technology, they're interested in understanding what's happening with their brain. And when you think about the different mental health conditions that we're talking about, it is not just all in your head. It is part and parcel of who you are, and it's part and parcel of the way in which your brain responds to different um, stresses. So if we think about, well, what are the apps that would help us manage stress? We've often heard about or talked about mindfulness. We've talked about uh, coping. We've talked about relaxing. We've talked about being outside and engaging. So it's not that the technologies are going to solve the problems of the world. It's how do we use those technologies to enhance the things that we might do to manage stressful events. Smiling Mind, an app created by two stressed out executives, Janie Martino and James Tutton. It's designed to help people understand how to bring themselves into the moment based on a whole host of evidence. But the app in and of itself, yes, it's good, yes, it's important, yes, it can be used by children and young people and stressed out academics or stressed out uh, professionals, but the idea of the app is in and of itself a neat idea but what's important is understanding how it might work. So if you couple that then with what's the major issue for young people that causes them stress, 
relationship breakdown. Kids Helpline created a nice, simple, beautiful app co-designed with young people to help them manage their relationships. Again, explaining that this is part and parcel of moving through adolescent development. These are all available on the App Store and the Android Store. Goalsy, how do I actually use gaming to support my, um, my help-seeking activities? Music Escape, one of the most simple ways in which you can actually get young people engaged in understanding how music affects their mood or how their mood affects their behaviour. So again, researchers from Queensland University of Technology working with music therapists to say, what are the things that young people enjoy doing? Listening to music is one of them. Can we put a cadence against the songs that they're listening to so that people can understand what it means to feel angry and the songs that might be related to anger to take them to a happy place? For example, Rage Against the Machine might be a song that makes you feel angry. <laughs> if you want to go to your happy place, you might listen to Happy Feet or one of the happier songs, Walking on Sunshine. But the idea being that young people can start to see how their thoughts and their feelings affect their mood and how they can use music to regulate the mood that they might have. But does this all work? And this is where the science of it comes into play. So having a conversation, helping young people understand what's going on for them, getting them searching, Googling, looking at, what does this actually do to your brain? So there's a great research um, done by Harvard around MRI studies proving that meditation literally rebuilds the brain after eight weeks of practice. <coughs> Mindfulness course, not a long time, 27 minutes per day. So people ask, well, how long should I be doing this? What does it look like? They reckon 27 minutes. Massachusetts General Hospital, so it's based on science and evidence. MRI scans showed how meditation produced massive changes in the brain's grey matter. An increase in grey matter density in the hippocampus, so you can start to talk about the way in which your brain responds to stresses and the whole host of things. Important conversation to have because it's about the science of why our body is responding in a way that it is. And then a decreased grey matter density in the amygdala, amygdala. Again, interesting from a scientific point of view, interesting from an engagement point of view, interesting from having a conversation with a young person about what's going on in your brain that might be resulting in these stress um, feelings. Again, there are a whole host of fact sheets that parents can use, but again, as a conversation starter. This one's headspace.org, not to be confused with Headspace um, Australian organisation. This is a UK-based mindfulness app. But again, a whole host of resource that explains in nice, simple ways why mindfulness is good to manage stress. Sleep. Who gets enough of it? You're here on a, uh, what night are we? Monday night? <laughs> I think in my world, it's about 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so sleep is probably one of the most underrated uh, resources and tools that we have. Again, having a conversation with a young person about getting enough sleep, particularly in a world where we are digitally connected, is a challenge. So the ongoing conversation is, well, what does it actually mean to ensure that you get enough sleep? Not only for our young people, but for adults. So what does that look like? And then convincing young people that it's actually good for you. So again, not from a negative, oh, you need to get to bed, you need to get to sleep, and these are the reasons why. Excellent TED talk by Professor Russell Foster, which explains why sleep is good for your brain and why it literally rebuilds your brain. Now the Recharge app, again, was based on science which showed that if young people or people go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, get X number of hours of sleep, within two hours get up and are active, that it will actually increase their mood. Whole science around it, but from a stigmatised, non-stigmatising perspective, it's easy to have that conversation about why this is good for you. Back it up with a TED talk and then it actually becomes a far more interesting conversation. Or do which is something that my mum did, which is get her jawbone up, and my little girl Holly discovered that mummy had a purple one from Hester that was probably a $5 version of grandma's $150 version. And so then she started having competitions with grandma about who could get the most exercise and who could get the most sleep. Again, it's not the technology, it's the conversation that matters. It's a conversation about what does this mean for me, what does it mean for me to get enough sleep, what does it mean for me to manage my stress level. Exercise, again, 
Everyone's talking about getting out and getting 10,000 steps. Um, what does it look like? How do, you, how do you carve it up so that it doesn't become onerous, it doesn't become a challenge? Couch to 5K, excellent app, which again is about setting realistic parameters. Within a day, get out and do 500 metres. Next day, do a kilometre. One day, run. One day, walk. It doesn't matter as long as you are getting out and getting active and getting some sunshine. The up three, I've talked about biometrics. I think in terms of the way in which we're heading with the technologies, the biometrics, the assistive technologies, this will become increasingly the way of the future. We are really interested in how we are going to shift and change what has been a very top-down medical model to one which is a bottom-up, how do we actually support people to manage and self-regulate and look after their own mental health. In our perfect world, rather than going in and seeing the doctor and being prescribed sleeping tablets or being prescribed an antidepressant, we want the conversation to be, how much sleep do you get, how much exercise do you get, and how can we support you to self-manage your mental health and well-being? That's not to say that I don't agree with pharmacological treatments. I do if they are right and appropriate. Social connection, single biggest thing that's important to young people. This evidence has been around since the 1950s. It is important that young people feel valued, that they are able to participate, that they are connected. The fact that you guys have been involved in the development of an app is less about the development of the app and more about the fact that it has created a social connectivity and given young people something that they feel important and valued for, their opinion and their voice. And so the social connection part of it, again, incredibly important. Increasingly, we're moving to, rather than single apps, the idea of concierge services. How do we bring these things together in a way that's meaningful for people? The toolbox, again, designed by reachout.com, fabulous resource for teachers, for parents, for young people, around the resources that are available for them. Hello, Sunday morning not for a younger audience, but certainly for an audience over the age of 18 around how do you change Australia's drinking culture? How do you as a community take a break from alcohol and sign up to this community and compare what it might mean uh, for each of you to be a part of that? Setting some limits started by a guy, Chris Rain, a young man out of Queensland who was working with the Queensland government trying to educate young people about binge drinking finding himself out on a Friday night and a Saturday night binge drinking and realising actually this education thing is not working. I know all the harmful consequences, I know what it's going to do for me, but it's actually not changing my behaviour. And we know from all of the evidence, whether it's around drinking or whether it's around smoking cessation or whether it's around cyber safety, education alone does not work. It is not enough to change behaviour. And so we need to think in a clever way about what it means to actually socially engage and socially connect to change, change not just people's thoughts and feelings, but the behaviours in which they're engaging with. Kick It, again, a new app that's on the market, about to be on the market, which is about how do you actually support people to give up smoking. In the mental health space, the comorbidity between mental illness, um, cigarette smoking, alcohol and drug use, adds to the additional burden resulting in a much higher morbidity rate, and a combination of both mental health and physical health conditions. I won't talk too much about cyber safety because I know you're going to do this, but if you are interested as parents, concerned about how young people are using technology, a great resource and toolbox is the Office of the Children's eSafety Commissioner. It has all of the resources that have been collected around Australia, evidence-based, um, worth jumping on and have a look at particularly for parents, particularly for young people, and particularly for educators. How am I going for time, Colin? Okay, I'm almost finished. So to finish up, and again, this is not a one-size-fits-all. It is not saying technology is the panacea that is going to solve the problems of the world. It is being realistic about how to get the balance right and what it means to actually support people to engage, to be connected, and to feel that they have meaning and purpose. Again, evidence coming out of the United States from Stanford very simply said, people have much better mental health when they are grateful for what they have. Our young people designed a gratitude app. It is really simple. And again, listening to the young woman that we met today, she was talking about for herself in the management of her own mental illness. She will look up quotes. She will look and read and listen to and hear stories about being grateful for the life that people have. So very simple, 
rather than the focus on the negativity, the bad things about the internet, what we said is, can you actually build social networks that are based around gratitude? And if you can, does that actually improve a person's mental health and their well-being? And the answer is yes. Um, again, not on its own, but within the context of having a conversation about being respectful, about being respected online. And to finish, again, we don't want to create young people as crazy psychologists. We want our young people to do what our young people need to do, which is to be engaged, to be able to learn, to be able to enjoy um, spending time with their friends, to be able to be a part of their communities. And so Beyond Blue, working again in partnership with young people, said, what would it mean to actually ensure that you know what support is available, when you might seek that support, and how you might actually get that support? So check-in really is about giving young people skills so that they know how to support a friend who might be experiencing a mental health condition. It provides tailored step-to-step -step check in plans so that young people can systematically look after their mate but not take on the responsibility. It allows young people to review their conversation. It gives some ideas for how things get tricky. tricky. Um, but importantly, it connects them into professional support and care so that they know that they do not have to take on the responsibility of the young person themselves. It's simple, it's easy to use, and it allows them to plan how they might support each other. So I'll finish there and hand over to Giselle and Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Isn't it great that uh, we're just not talking about the social element of social media, but how we use it to actually improve uh, total health, including our mental health. So thanks very much for that. Mm -hmm.